And you'll find that they, the title has a phrase right out of our text. It's an interesting phrase. It's really quite, it summarizes very nicely a very complicated doctrine, and that would be the doctrine of election. Now, the passage is not teaching a lot of information about that, but we'll see later on as we read the Bible verses that it will say this, speaking of those Gentiles who believed, and all who were chosen for eternal life became believers. It gets to be a little complicated trying to understand how God does the work. Now, we know that he does the work, and he's been, he's been very purposeful. And we can look back through history. We might go back four or 5,000 years before Christ, and we find Adam and Eve in the garden. Oh, we don't know exactly the years, but it might have been about that long ago. And if you remember, there was the great failure there when Adam did not stand his ground on, on the matters of holiness. And he ate of that forbidden fruit. And sin came in, and the curse of sin infiltrated every part of the universe. About 2,000 years before Christ, God said to Abraham, he chose Abraham. Why did he choose Abraham? Just because he did. I mean, God can do that, obviously. And he chose Abraham, and he said to Abraham, Abraham, I am going to bless you. More importantly, from you will come a great nation. More importantly than that, from that great nation there will come the Messiah, the Savior. About 1,500 years ago, God kept, or 1,500 years before uh, the birth of Christ, God kept his promise and he delivered the people of Israel. They had grown to a great nation in number, although had no organization whatsoever, and Moses became that leader. We go to about a thousand years before Christ, and now David, the greatest king of all, the king that, that painted a picture of what Messiah would be like as the great coming king of kings. About 500 years before the birth of Christ, Daniel came. And if you can remember when we studied Daniel, it was filled with prophetic information that all of a sudden as we listen to the news today, we can go back and say, you know what, Daniel talked about that. All of that to show us that what is happening in the book of Acts is not by accident. It is not God reacting to something that he did not anticipate. He is sovereign. He is all-knowing. What we find in the book of Acts is God bringing about the completion of some of those promises that he's made. Thankfully, there are many more he is yet to fulfill. Somebody has asked me on a number of occasions, how do I approach evangelism? I think it's very important that every day we get up and we say, Lord, give me an opportunity. Now, some of you see many more people than I do. But even at that, I'm always surprised at how many opportunities God will bring to me to, to share a word. Now, it's not always the opportunity to give the entire gospel plan. But there's an opportunity to share a word of testimony, to encourage somebody, to pray with somebody, to, to, to make sure that people understand this God I speak about, he is real. I know that we are told by the teachings of Christ that we are to sow the seed. Everywhere we go, we're to sow the seed. But there is this understanding when we read through the Bible that God is at work behind the scenes preparing people for the gospel communicating the gospel to them, perhaps through our testimony, perhaps through our card, our letter, our word that we've given, but it's really through the work of the Holy Spirit. And God is eager, and that's important for us to understand. God is eager for many to come to faith in Christ. It's a bit like an Easter egg hunt. Do you remember doing that when you were a child? Remember how exciting it was? 
and you would run out with your bucket and you'd find the eggs. Of course, some of the eggs were easy to find. And then you would come back and there'd be somebody in charge and they would count the eggs and they would say, oh, there are 14 more eggs out there. And what do most of the kids do? Most of the kids say, 14 more and they're out again. Come back in. There are still four out there. And they go out, and every once in a while you'll get some that get tired, but there are some who will hunt and hunt until the final egg is found. In some ways, that's the most exciting egg to find. That's the way it is with God's plan of evangelism. It is our job to go out. You remember these words from Matthew chapter 28. Go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. A bit later in Acts chapter 1, you'll see here it will say, You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere. We have this great opportunity to be a part of this work that God has foreordained before the beginning of time. And we will be witnesses of those chosen for eternal life, becoming believers. Well, there's a real change. Now, chapter 13 is full of a lot of transition. If you've noticed, we've gone from Jerusalem being the center of the Christian community, and now Antioch has become the center of the Christian community. Beforehand, Peter was the main part, part of our story, the main person in our story, and now it is Paul. Even in chapter 13, we had Barnabas and Paul, and now it is Paul and Barnabas. A great transitional chapter. We see something else that is happening here. Though God has been systematically reaching into the Gentile community to bring many to Christ, we see a real transition that takes place in this latter part of Acts chapter 13. So let's begin by reading our text. You'll see that's written, uh, printed in bold print, and then I'll share my notes with you. Acts chapter 13, starting at verse 44. The following week, almost the entire city went out to hear them preach the word of the Lord. Do you remember last week we talked about they invited Paul and Barnabas to share? Paul got up, and that was our first sermon that we could see of Paul. He preached the gospel of Christ, that God had made promises, and God keeps every promise, and the promises all culminate in this person of Christ. And that everybody has an opportunity. And you must believe. You must trust in Christ. Afterwards, the city exploded with conversation. Apparently, it was all over. Now, this is a large city. A city filled with temples to many, many different gods and goddesses. The Jewish community, no doubt, would have been small compared to the greater community of this second Antioch that we speak of. And here we find this news is just bubbling. It's going everywhere. All of a sudden, now it is Saturday, the Sabbath again, and not just all the Jews have come, but people from all over the city have come. They want to know what is happening. Now, it's important for us to note that this city has had a history of riots and all kinds of rebellion and troubles like that. So every time a large group would get together, no doubt the Roman authorities were a little bit suspicious of what might happen. So here we find verse 45, but when some of the Jews saw the crowds, they were jealous. So they slandered Paul and argued against whatever he said. Then Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly and declared, it was necessary that we first preach the word of God to you Jews. But since you have rejected it and judged yourselves unworthy of eternal life, we will offer it to the Gentiles. Now, that doesn't seem to be a big deal to us, but to the ancient world, that was a big announcement. 
You remember going through that history, obviously all of that dealt with the Jewish people. And now the purpose was, the law, we're told by Paul later on in the book of Galatians, the purpose was that we might understand how holy God is. And in, and in reflecting upon that, we might see how sinful we are and how we are in great need of a Redeemer. Now that was God's plan all the way through the Old Testament was to prepare a people and ultimately to prepare the world for this great announcement. That Redeemer that you need has come. He is here. First, the announcement was made in Bethlehem. Come see the Savior. And now it's been shouted nearly in every corner of the world, those words on the cross, it is finished. And now we share the news. There is a Savior. He has come and he has done the work of redemption. But the Jews had developed a real serious problem in pride. Because they were selected by God to bring the Savior to the world, they had decided that they were special to God. Indeed, they were, but they took that beyond just the, the appreciation of it and became very prideful. Uh, they had a lot of dietary laws and other laws concerning behavior that separated them from the Gentile. And if you remember, there's a lot of conversation through the Gospels about the Gentiles being dogs, which was a derogatory term. The Gentiles not being worthy of anything good that would come, not even crumbs that would come off the table of the household of God. So here you've got this, this great divide between the Jewish community and all the Gentile communities. And Jesus came and said, the message I have is for all people. And in so doing, he said to those Pharisees, if, if somebody's, Pharise or somebody's religion is like yours, Pharisees, it's not good enough. Because all you've done is encourage your pride. You've not gotten any closer to God. All you've done is pushed others away from the preaching of the word, not encourage them to come. So God is making a very bold move right here. He is saying through this work that Paul is doing in, in this chapter we're looking at, he's saying, listen, you have proved yourself unworthy of the gospel. And now the gospel is going to go into the Gentile world. Just a couple of things to note here. The gospel is rejected by the Jews. Why? Well, a number of reasons. Let's look at three that I share with you. Paul and Barnabas presented the wrong Messiah. You see that's in quotation marks. They presented the wrong Messiah. This Messiah died for all men. This Messiah loved all sinners. And the Jewish community just could not comprehend that. And when Paul and Barnabas preached Christ Again, Christ becomes a stumbling block, the cornerstone that the Jewish nation would trip over. Another reason, letter B, Jesus could not possibly be the Messiah, they felt, because he was crucified. He was placed under the curse of God. Any claim that he was the Messiah, therefore, was blasphemous. And here's why they thought that. Look at the verse in Deuteronomy 21. If someone has committed a crime worthy of death and is executed and hung on a tree, he is cursed in the sight of God. Galatians chapter 3. But Christ has rescued us from the curse pronounced by the law. When he was hung on the cross, he took upon himself the curse for our wrongdoing. For it is written in the scriptures, Cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. Through Christ Jesus, God has blessed the Gentiles with the same blessing he promised to Abraham, so that we who are believers might receive the promised Holy Spirit through faith. 
Again, you're familiar with this verse. For God made Christ who never sinned to be the offering for our sin so that we could be made right with God through Christ. They could not, the Jews, could not comprehend how their Messiah would die on a cross. How could that be? He was supposed to come in power and kick the Romans out and reign in holiness and righteousness. So in their estimation, Paul and Barnabas preached the wrong Christ. They preached something they could not begin to comprehend. And then we've hinted at this. They resented its implication that forgiveness for sins is not found in doing works of the law. Again, the law was given that we might see the holiness of God. And in reflecting on that, we might begin to understand our own wickedness. And that would create in us a desire for a redeemer. And in fact, all that we see in the Old Testament leads up to the birth, the life, the death, the burial, and the resurrection, and the promise that Christ is coming again. Oh, I mean... This is big news that Paul is preaching, and the Jews do not get it at all. All they can think of is, wait a minute, we're God's people and we're living God's way, so of course we're more holy than anybody else. Let's go back to our text, chapter 13 of the book of Acts, verse 47. For the Lord gave us this command when he said, I have made you a light to the Gentiles to bring salvation to the farthest corners of the earth. When the Gentiles heard this, they were very glad and thanked the Lord for his message. And all who were chosen for eternal life became believers. So the Lord's message spread throughout that region. The Jews rejected the gospel, but we see here that the gospel is embraced by the Gentiles. They didn't have the background of the Old Testament, but they were easily convinced they were sinners. They knew that. They were easily convinced that they needed a redeemer. And when Paul, this renowned Jewish teacher, stood up and said, I can tell you by examination of the law, and I can tell you by personal experience that there is forgiveness of sin when you repent and place your faith in Christ in the work that he has done. When the Gentiles heard that, there was a great celebration. Let's go back a little bit into Acts chapter 9 and look at the words here. Ananias was told to go to Saul. Saul is my chosen instrument to take my message to the Gentiles and to kings as well as to the people of Israel spoken about Paul, or in this text, known also as Saul. If you remember in Romans chapter 1, Paul said this, For I am not ashamed of this good news about Christ. It is the power of God at work, saving everyone who believes, the Jew first and the Gentile. So that becomes Paul's pattern. Everywhere he goes, he goes into the synagogue, and he offers the gospel. He explains it very carefully. This is what our law and what our prophets have told us. This is Christ, and you must receive Christ. And time and time again, the majority of the Jews would say, we'll have nothing to do with that Christ. In fact, shortly after this, in the next century, in order to be a Jewish, a faithful Jew in the synagogue, you had to come and be a part of the cursing of Christ. The division is starting now, but it becomes incredibly wide and deep. Indeed, it is now. The most difficult group to reach on the face of the earth is the Orthodox Jew. But Paul's pattern was, I preach to the Jews first, and if they respond, it's a great time of celebration, but if they reject it, I turn and I preach to the Gentiles. It was always his intention to preach to both, but that's his pattern. Notice this quote I picked up from Stephen Cole, a preacher that I often read. It says, The gospel confronts every sinner with his sin. 
It confronts the religious sinner with his pride. It confronts the immoral sinner with his immorality. It confronts the greedy sinner with his love of money. It convicts every sinner of his guilt before the holy God. Then it offers to every sinner the free grace of God who sacrificed his own son as the just substitute for sinners. It shows that no sinner can save himself, but that God will save everyone who cast himself on Jesus alone. If we are saved, it's because God chose to save us, and all the glory goes to him. If we are lost, it's because of our stubborn pride and disobedience. That message is divisive or divisive because it confronts human pride and glorify God, glorifies God alone. It is the only message that we are to proclaim. Somebody would like to know, how does free will fit into all of this? And that's another discussion for another day. And this illustration does not fully explain it, but let me share it with you. Let's say that you know you've got a heart issue. I mean, something's not right with your heart. You go to a doctor, and the doctor looks at it, and he says, oh, you need a specialist. Well, that makes you all the more worried. And now you go to the specialist, and he orders a battery of tests. And he looks at it and he brings in a couple of his colleagues and they're looking at it. And they come to you and they say, Bruce, your heart is just this close to failure. Your only hope is a heart transplant. Do you want to do it? Do you really have a choice? Do you? I mean, I guess you do. You could say no. But if you say no, it's certain death. So do you really have a choice? No, you've been brought to a place where the only answer can be yes. Do that surgery. There is a work that God's Holy Spirit does. When he convicts us and he blocks off this way and this way and he stops us from going that way and he gets us backed into a corner... And then he says, don't you want to receive Christ? And haven't you been there to where you thought to yourself, there is no other answer. I must say yes. I have been brought to the cross by the Spirit of God. I have been convicted of my sin. I've been convinced of the promises of God. There can be no answer other than yes, I believe in Christ. That is what's happening with the work that God does all around the world. Those that he has ordained don't fully understand it, but all that he has ordained will believe. And he is still doing that work today. Now, the reason Christ has not returned is not because all of the political events haven't occurred the way they need to. The reason Christ has not returned is because he is still reaching lost men, women, and children, and young people with the gospel of Christ. There are more to be gathered in. Let's go back to our text, chapter 13, verse 50. Then the Jews stirred up the influential religious women and the leaders of the city, and they incited a, rob, uh, a mob rather, against Paul and Barnabas, and ran them out of town. So they shook the dust from their feet as a sign of rejection and went to the town of Iconium. And the believers were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. That shaking off the dust is a common practice of the day, saying, hey, if you don't want us, we have nothing to do with you. It was said that the Jews, when they came into Israel, would shake the dust off after having crossed Gentile lands because they didn't want to bring any of that dirty dirt into the holiness of the Israel, of the nation of Israel. So the gospel is embraced by the Gentiles. Number three, the gospel divided the city. It continues to divide. Why is that? Well, you see it in 2 Corinthians 5.17. Anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. 
The old life is gone. A new life has begun. That new life challenges the way sinners are living. But it's more than just the change that God does in our hearts. Point number, or point letter, or letter B, our next point. Speaking of John chapter 1, verse 1, where Christ comes, and it says, His life brought light to everyone. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness can never extinguish it. He came into the very world he created, and the world didn't recognize him. He came to his own people, and even they rejected him. But to all who believed him and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. When the light shines, people's motives are exposed. And that's one reason it creates such division. Way back in the day when I would drive a school bus on occasion on, on events, every bus driver's great joy when you're going to a ball game or coming back from a ball game is turning on the lights so that you can control what's happening in the back, in the darkness. And everybody would pull away because, you know, the couples were kissing and who knows what else might have been happening. And they'd say, shut off the light, shut off the light. And I'd leave it on for a while, then shut it off. A little bit later, when it got too quiet, turn on the light again. The light exposes the wickedness. And thus people hate the light. Well, I've got a YouTube video I'd like for you to listen to. It's by Third Day. Many of you will recognize the name of that group, or you might recognize this man's voice. But it illustrates... Perfectly, It's a perfect summary of what we're talking about. What can I do to be right with God? Well, this song will tell that.
Would you close your eyes and bow your heads, please? The theme of that song is so obvious, to trust in Jesus. We will all stand before the Lord. We'll have to give an account. What can we say? What should we say? All we can say is what he so clearly said. I know what to say. When asked, I'm going to say, I trusted in Jesus. That was the great gospel message that Paul preached to the Jews and to the Gentiles. It is that same gospel message that the Holy Spirit preaches to the heart of every American, Brazilian, Catholic, Baptist, Protestant, of any kind, Buddhist, it doesn't matter. The message is the same. It's this. Have you trusted in Jesus? Now, that's the most important question that you can answer today. And I would encourage you to sit before the Lord and say, Lord, I haven't been sure, but I'm going to be sure today because I'm going to say flat out, I will trust in Jesus 100% and what he has done for me. Nothing I can add, nothing anybody can take away. It is Christ and Christ alone who is my Redeemer. Father, we're so thankful for that clarity of the message presented in this chapter. How it's based on history. It's based on the scriptures, most importantly. Lord, it's been validated by the experience of millions and millions of people because they have experienced the peace that comes with the forgiveness that Christ offers. Father, we're so thankful that the offer is eternal life, abundant life. So, Father, I'm praying that here, if there's anybody who's not sure, that they would make their declaration in their heart right now to make it certain, make it once and for all clear. We are going to trust in Jesus and in him alone. Father, we ask for this as we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you so much for your good attention. I appreciate that.